Welcome to Establish the Edge. I'm your host, Mike Leone, with an exciting episode here today. I've got Justin Herzig, former winner of the Best Ball Mania original contest. And he's going to go through the underdog playoff format and the gauntlet tournament, which has a million dollars in prizes right now. I've got that up on the screen. If you're watching on YouTube, only $25 entry fee, which works out because underdog is sponsoring this podcast. If you use promo code ETR over at underdog fantasy, you'll get a deposit match bonus up to a hundred dollars. If it's your initial de- initial deposit. So make sure you check out underdog fantasy, use promo code ETR over there. Justin, thanks so much for joining me. This best ball contest is always a ton of fun and there's a lot of edge because the format's a little bit tricky. And if people don't draft the right way, you know, you, you're setting yourself up to be pretty plus EV. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. It's my favorite time of the year. Even before underdog started rolling these out, I was doing the, uh, you know, various either private leagues or you had some of the bigger tournaments, but it was always so much fun to kind of add the playoff uh, strategy elements to it because you kind of got to do the if then scenarios, you got to make some bets on which teams you think are going to, you know, do well. And then when that happens, who are the players that actually get you there? Uh, so one of my favorite times of the year for fantasy football and you know, Hey, this, this underdog best ball stuff for the playoffs is definitely, definitely plus EV. If you're doing it correctly, there are so there's so much dead money for people who are just, uh, Oh, I'm just going to jump in. I'm going to draft the best plays and that may work for your weekly DFS, but that is just going to set you up for maybe some min caches at best in this one. And that's not what we're going for. Yeah. We're going for this first place prize. You can see on the screen, a hundred thousand dollars with the a million dollars in total prizes right now, right now in the gauntlet. And to do that, you're going to need, you know, players at each stage of the playoffs competing for you. It's not going to be a cumulative point total, which is something that's important for people to realize, but even zooming out a bit further than that, it's a $25 entry fee. Justin, as far as drafts go, you know, how long do they take? How many rounds is it? How many people are in your league? Yeah. So definitely not too long. I'd say maybe, I don't know, about eight to 10 minutes per draft or such. Uh, There are 10 rounds and six people in your league. Uh, each week you will be starting five players, a quarterback, a running back, two wide receivers slash tight ends and one flex. And then you'll have those five bench spots as well. Uh, but knowing that you need to have at least five to really have a chance at, you know, advancing each week and more importantly, scoring that top score in the Super Bowl uh, is important when we talk through strategy. Uh, as for a tournament, $25 might be a little high price point if you're trying to max out and do a bunch of these. But keep in mind, there will be some mittens coming later on, which will be a little lower price point. Um, and earlier on, we had some wild cards. So when you jump into these, while we're going to be talking primarily today about the gauntlet and that structure, keep in mind that before you jump in these tournaments, look at the rules, figure out how many people advance. For example, with the upcoming mittens, I believe they're going to have two out of six advance out of the first round. In the gauntlet, it's only one out of six. That's very important when you're drafting teams that are going to have or likely will have the buy, because if you need the perfect week against your five competitors to advance, that's a lot different than if you can kind of get that second best and squeak through an Eagles or uh, whoever's what number, number one seed in the AFC team. Yeah, this whole contest is a balancing act between setting yourself up to be able to win the Super Bowl week when the prizes are huge, but giving yourself a good enough chance to actually get there. So those advance rates are huge. So as far as the advance rates, why don't you tell people for the gauntlet, you know, what the advance rate is for each stage. And also like, at what point do we make money and how much money? And do you ever care at all about, you know, the min cash side of things? Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you're, if you're focusing on that min cash at all, it's a futile effort because you're only having one out of six advance. And then it's basically one out of six. If you then lose the next one, you're getting that min cash. So if you're trying to do like a 17, 18% of the time you're min cashing, you're going to be losing so much of this money comes down to that really final round, that championship. And that's why that's what we're playing for. So when we look at it from a rock, from a construction wise with each tournament, you have your six person group. In that six-person group, you need to finish top one in the gauntlet to advance. In round two, you get placed into another six-person group at which you need to finish top one. So that'll be, think of the wild card round, the division round. Again, we then go to the the, um, the, the penultimate, the second one, 
uh, second to last, and that'll be the conference championships. Again, you need to finish, uh, I think it's first out of an eight person group for that one to then get you to the Super Bowl, which in the Super Bowl, there will then be 157 entries in this format. So again, it's one out of six, one out of six, one out of eight, and then the Super Bowl, 157 in the Super Bowl. And if you look at the prizes here, if you get last place out of the 157, that's 800. If you get first, that's 100,000. This is why it's so important to make sure that when you get to the Super Bowl, you have a team that has a legitimate shot to finish near the top. And how are you going to do that? It's going to be by having as many players as possible in that final week. And if you end up having like what? Last year, we had Cincinnati and the Rams, two teams. Neither of them got the bye. The teams that ended up winning this all, they had pretty much full stacks of those. Maybe they had eight players and one off pieces because they had the Gabe Davis who had the crazy week last week. And you may have needed that to advance and such. But for the most part, they were able to form a very complete team, and that's how they got that top prize. Yeah, and people might be thinking, okay, well, that was a pretty unlikely Super Bowl pairing heading into the playoffs, but that's kind of the point. Like, We kind of want to benefit from the chaos here because it's it's so beneficial in terms of the payout structures. Uh, is there a pairing, like if it's one seed versus one seed, where you're just kind of throwing your hands up and like, you know, I'm probably not going to win if that's the case, or are there ways around trying to win if the top two seeds each go, which right now there's some variance, particularly on the AFC side of things, as far as to, you know, who actually will be the one seed. Yeah. I mean, I'm building a balanced portfolio and obviously going into this structure wise, you can kind of ask yourself like, Hey, how many are you going to enter? If you're only going to enter one, three, five, ten, 10 or so, like, you know, maybe choose the teams that you think have the best shot of playing the first round and making it all the way through. If you're going to go with, Hey, I'm going to go for, you know, a well-balanced portfolio. I'm going to have a bunch of these. That's where it does make sense to kind of plan for, well, what if it is a Eagles and whoever the one seed is on the other side? It's a little challenging right now because, as you said, we don't know who that AFC is. So you don't really want to structure that wise. But let's look at the Eagles as an example. We know the Eagles are going to get the buy. I think they're 99 percent likelihood of getting that buy right now. What that means is. Not that you should completely fade the Eagles. If you look at our rankings, it's definitely pushing the Eagles down because from a structure wise, like it's harder to take those. Um, it's harder to take those players and still advance. But that's not saying don't take them. When you do take them, think about how you're building the rest of the roster construction. Because if you're going to draft Jalen Hurts in the first, A.J. Brown in the second, Miles Sanders in the third, and maybe even a DeMonta Smith or Dallas Goddard, that's four three, four of your players you know in that week one are not going to be advancing. So maybe if you have that team, it's less important for you to find another stack of four players in the AFC because if the Eagles get to the Super Bowl and you're alive, you've already got four on a high-scoring team. You may only need one or two from the other team. So in this scenario, if you have those four Eagles, maybe on the AFC, maybe you throw in Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen. But also maybe you throw in J.K. Dobbins and Mark Andrew or and Lamar, because in that first round, you need to advance one out of six when three, four of your best players are not going to be playing. And so how to do that? Well, you want high upside players on the other side that not only are going to score in the wild card round, but also provide you some of those peak spike opportunities in the Super Bowl. And that's why I think like I've done some teams that are Eagles, Baltimore Chargers, because it fits so well. I, fo mm -hmm. I focus on the first three, four picks being Eagles. Then that middle spot, you can grab Lamar, you can grab Mark Andrews or a Dobbins late, and you can likely get like an Eckler or one of the Chargers. Now, Chargers have become a bit more expensive now that they're 88% likely to make the playoffs, but these kind of structures still going to exist. You just got to think about, okay, how do I get those spite that early first round wild card pivotal points while my Eagles are on by. So then I can hopefully have my Eagles lead me to the Super Bowl. Yeah, you definitely want to reverse engineer. I know I did a draft on ship chasing with Peter Oversat, Pat Curran, and Ben Gretsch. And we started with a Buffalo stack. So it was the opposite side of the bracket. And then the NFC side, we were able to go, I think we did like four person Buffalo stack and was able to go three on Tampa Bay, three on Seattle, which at that point in time, I think Seattle's odds were a little bit better to make the playoffs and see what they are. They're down right like 33. Third, yeah, they're down to 30% on 538, which which isn't as strong. But you're going to get some really big discounts on these teams that don't have a chance to make the playoffs, which we'll get into that a little bit more later. But 
Uh, regardless, like structurally, though, you can kind of see what it is. You've got your AFC Super Bowl team, and then you're kind of making a couple bets on the other side of the conference to one, make sure you got enough players to advance you in round one. But then also, you've got kind of like two shots at getting that NFC team right as far as who's going to be playing in the Super Bowl. I think for me, and again, Justin's got his rankings over on Established to Run. I've got them pulled up if you're watching on YouTube. It's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. You can select multiple teams kind of just as you're figuring out your stacks, just have those teams up in the rankings. Um, but, and he's also got his article, How to Beat the Playoff Challenge, which goes over in depth a lot of what we're talking about right now. Um, for me, where I struggle, Justin, sometimes is when it works out the way you're talking, it's great, right? Like I draft my Super Bowl team. I draft my two opposing stacks from the other conference. They're going to play early. What if it doesn't break that cleanly or that smoothly for you? Like when are you detouring to just say, okay, I'm going to draft Derrick Henry because maybe he's a bad example because he's a little risky to even play in round one at this point. Barkley. But what, yeah, what are you, when are you going to draft Saquon Barkley and no other Giants just to get those round one points? Yeah, I think like Barkley's a good example right there where now after that win last night, the Giants are at 87% likelihood to make the playoffs. And uh, so Barkley, we know, I mean, even though he's kind of slowed down, um, he still has that kind of, hey, running back goodness that can get, deliver you those 20 points in the wild card round. Um, for me, though, it depends on what kind of structure I'm looking for. If it is one of those teams that I think is going to be on by, then I do want to go for those one-off pieces that are important. But if it's not, then I'd rather lean into a team that has studs that are likely, you know, that are less than that 50% to make the playoffs. But if they do, are in great shape. So Mm -hmm. right now, like the Seahawks, I think are still a great example. Yes, they are 30% like, you know, have 30% likelihood to make the playoffs. But if you've got your AFC stack on the other side, if you went Chiefs, Bills, Bengals, whatever it is, and now uh, you were trying to get the 49ers, but somebody reached on them, or you were trying to get the Cowboys, but then next thing you know, Zeke, Gallup, Schultz, they all go pretty quickly. Rather than me being like, okay, I'm going to go for a min cash. I'm just going to grab the one-off studs. I'm like, all right, let me take this opportunity for that 30% likelihood that the Seahawks actually make the playoffs. Because now if they do, okay, I'm getting these low-owned players. And most importantly, I'm getting the best players on that team. And that's where this really differs from the DFS side of things is, you know, when Leone and team are making these projections for DFS on a weekly basis, there's one thing we know for sure is that that team is playing on this given day. So those projections, the game is locked in for this, our projections. Yes. Like we put out these rankings, they're helpful, but they're far from the end all be all because the most important, the most determinant factor in all this is how many games they advance. And so the Seahawks are going to be even lower on these rankings now after this week with their loss to San Francisco. But all that you got to do is tinker with one variable, which is, oh, no, they actually make a run and win one, two, three playoff games. And now if some crazy scenario, they make it to the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's not likely, especially when they're not likely to make the playoffs. But if they do, you're almost guaranteed to have that team continue to advancing and you're doing it at low ownership. That's what we're looking for to get that 100K, 35K in second, whatever it is for the, you know, those top prizes. Yeah. And you touched on something there that I think for me was like the biggest aha moment when I first read your article, I don't know if it was last year or the year before when they first had this contest in the playoffs, but it was, it is better to get the best teams on a team, the best, I'm sorry, the best players on a team that people are undervaluing or don't like their odds than it is to kind of make some of those safer bets that are a little bit disjointed that aren't as correlated because if that team makes a run, you have the right players. Um, and it's, you know, again, a balancing act, but people are almost, almost too focused on the certainty of playing a game or on projected points based off expected games when, you know, this isn't going to be average again, it's not cumulative scoring. And that's really huge. Do you also want to note with our rankings that uh, you can download them and upload them to underdog real easily? So we've talked a little bit about allocation well, as far as teams. Sorry, go ahead. I'll jump. I'll jump in, Leon, with what you were talking about real quick to just kind of put a little put a little bow on that. Um, last year, so right now we're at the gauntlet. We're going to have some more of the tournaments. Right before this was the wild card, which is their version of just like an an early or an early version. 
And so last year when we were drafted the wild card tournament, the Bengals were only like 50%, 60% to make the playoffs. Like if you don't remember a couple of weeks into the, you know, um, before the end of last season, the Bengals weren't even a guaranteed playoff spot. And so that's where I was really leaning in and saying like, okay, I'm going to be drafting Bengals because if they do make the playoffs, we love that offense. And uh, so I ended up getting a team that finished a half a point out of first place, finished second place in the wild card because it was like, I'm taking a risk and I'm going to be drafting Bengals. I didn't have the perfect stack. I was missing uh, Odell on the Rams side of things. But like that team, because I made a bet on a team that only had a 50, 60 percent chance to make the playoffs, in the Bengals ended up getting me all, to the, all the way to the Super Bowl and getting me second in that wild card one. Right now, the Bengals aren't that team with their 99 percent make the playoffs, but maybe someone else is. Maybe it is these Lions. Maybe it yeah. maybe it's the Jaguars like. We're not sure, but those are the these are the opportunities now to really lean in. Yeah, and if you look at the, um, we'll see the Lions in a second. Lions, Wait, and, look Lions the, and Jaguars aren't even on here right now because of how much their odds increase in the past week. Yeah, which means their ADPs are going to be slow and gradual to adjust, most likely. And we again, we talk about getting the best players on the team. Like you can get Amon Ross St. Brown. Uh, I'm assuming for like extremely cheap, you can get you know, Swifter, Jamal Williams, you know, you can make some of the bets on, on the wide receivers. Um, and I mean, again, I'm looking right, I'm looking right now and I'm on Rogers St. Brown's ADP is 54.6. Everyone else on the lions is higher than 59, meaning they're being drafted in like less than 5% of drafts. Goff 59.2, Swift 59.4, Jamison Williams, not being drafted at all. Chark, not being drafted at all. Like that'll change now that they had the, you know, this weekend was so important for them, but, yeah, we're already 25% to the gauntlet. So 25% of drafts won't have any of those players. Yeah, and to that team that I, I noted that I drafted with getting the right players on the right team, if that team hits, I think with that bill stack, we had, you know, like Godwin, Fernet, Evans, and then on the, on the Tampa Bay side, in the Seattle side, it was Walker, Metcalf, Lockett. So... Um, that was, that was pre-locking injury, but you can see where it's like, okay, those are clearly the best players on those teams that they advance. Like you're in really good shape, even if that's, that's not super likely, um, but shifting away from the construction, as far as teammates go um, and stacking there, what about positional allocation? Yeah. So first things first, it is not cumulative. You've mentioned that, but it's important making sure that's very clear. And what we, why that's important is from a quarterback situation. Um, if you are drafting Jalen Hurts, you need another quarterback to have a chance of getting out of the first round. If you draft Mahomes or Josh Allen, it's up to you whether you want to take a chance because 50% of the night, they're basically, I think it's like 40 and 50%. Uh, one of those is likely going to get the buy. Um, what are we at right now? Yeah, 50 and 39. Um, so you can obviously gamble a little, um, but those teams might be dead or they might really do well. But the key is, if you're grabbing a Bengals, Cowboys, someone like that, where, hey, you're stacking them, you know they're playing in the first round, you're making a bet that they're going to make the they're going to make the Super Bowl, you probably don't need to draft another quarterback. Or if you do, you should not be allocating a lot of draft capital to it. Because not only are we saying, hey, like we know that they're going to be playing in the first round, so we're getting the points there, but we're also making a projection that and an assumption that this team, the Bengals, the Cowboys, whatever we're going with, is going to make the Super Bowl. That means they're winning all three of those games to get to the Super Bowl. When you win games, your quarterback usually does well. So now we're already building in these assumptions that, okay, my quarterback is going to be doing well. They're going to be scoring enough points to win games. That quarterback is probably going to get you enough points to get to the Super Bowl on his own. It's probably not worth wasting more draft capital on another quarterback when you could instead try to start finding the peripheral pieces. Because come that Super Bowl matchup, we know that the highest scoring quarterback is going to be one of two players. So one of those two. Everything else is going to be kind of not random, but like you know that we could have um, – Tyler Boyd or Hayden Hurst finish the top score for the Bengals yeah. uh, for Dallas. Maybe it's Noah Brown. Maybe it's even T Y Hilton Dalton. Schultz, who knows? But like, it's more valuable to kind of get those one-off pieces. So if they do spike in the Super Bowl, you have them. Yeah. And then we also see as far as the starting positions, you're starting one running back, two pass catchers, wide receiver and tight end are, are lumped together in one flex, which 
is obviously going to result in you drafting more pass catchers than running backs because you can max start two running backs on a week, whereas you can start three pass catchers and you absolutely have to start two pass catchers. You have noted here your most common construction is two to four running backs, four to six wide receivers. Uh, why don't you talk through the running back versus wide receiver spot a little bit? And I guess I just know too, like running back to me seems like one of the spots that's best to, um, you know, maybe grab a, a big point total early. Um, like if you, the Saquon Barkley example, uh, I think yeah. it tends to fit here. Yeah, I think with running backs, I mean, they kind of like that theory, but it's even more from a correlation standpoint is when your team is running, the running back is usually running back is usually doing well. So if you're going to be taking the Bengals to make the Super Bowl, Joe Mixon is probably heavily involved in that game plan. And so if you have Joe, like it, it's that important to have Joe Mixon on your team um, where the Bengals can make the Super Bowl and, you know, Tyler Boyd. Uh, T Higgins, Jamar Chase, like they could have off weeks or such. Um, it's more likely that you're running back, especially, I mean, Derrick Henry's probably the clearest example with Tennessee. It's more likely that you're drafting that running back that is going to lead the team. They're going to be leading games. They're going to have more action. Uh, so for me, I'm pretty happy with, if I can get a, you know at least to the star running back from each of the two teams that I'm stacking, there's times I don't draft another running back. Because I already know, like, the only team this, the only way that this team is successful for me to the Super Bowl is both of these teams are winning. And if I have the starting running back in both of those, I'm probably getting substantial points out of at least one, if not both of them, each week. If I go Cowboys, maybe you want to try to get Pollard and Zeke. That makes complete sense, too. There's obviously outliers to this, but that's why I'm okay with doing just a two, three running back roster construction. The wide receivers, tight ends, also the most volatile of the positions. Um, swear so it's most important to kind of, if you do have the Bengals, it's that important to make sure we're getting Chase, Higgins, Boyd, Hurts, whatever it is, because there's more kind of uh, random or variance form of one game sample size of who's going to produce the most. Uh, and that's why, like, yeah, if I can get a roster construction, that's something like one QB, three running backs, and then six wide receivers. I feel great about that. Yeah. And you hit on to that assumption. If, you, basically each team is going to have some sort of core assumption that you're operating off of. And you're going back to best ball, like going for full season. One of the things we often talk about is draft as if you're right. And I feel like sometimes people misunderstand that where you don't want to assume every single thing in your lineup goes right, but you have some sort of core assumption that you have to work around. In this case, it's, you know, a certain team going to the Super Bowl, And if that team gets bounced early, you just got to take your L and accept you know, you weren't going to make it anyway. So you don't want to give yourself a false sense of security by making your team, you know, quote unquote safer when really all you're doing is hurting your EV because you're greatly reducing your odds of winning the overall prize. And as we hit on early, that's where most of the money is. That's where you're going to realize, you know, some positive ROI is by banking in, in the Super Bowl round. I know for me, like what, what, on that, Buffalo, Tampa Bay, Seattle example I used. I think we could have drafted one of the quarterbacks on the NFC way late. And at the time, Buffalo looked less likely to get the one seed. But I do sort of wonder if that was a mistake where the cost at that point was so low. Um, but I guess the, the flip side of that, too, is you have you don't have the Buffalo skill players round one. So maybe it is OK to, to have the extra skill player. What do you do in a scenario where you're drafting Buffalo, Kansas City right now? at quarterback are you drafting that second quarterback later is it kind of just based on what's available yeah and, and here's the other thing with what you were discussing so two points to it one is your concern maybe buffalo gets the buy and now buffalo and those three your josh allen plus his three other bills that you drafted are not going to play so now you're competing against five other teams in your pool and hoping that the bucks and the seahawks are able to produce enough points and you've got to throw on either a Geno or a Tom Brady, who's obviously not, you know, an uphill battle for him to compete against the Patrick Mahomes, the Lamars, the others that are going to be playing in that week one. So you've already, in a, you're in a tough situation if they get that buy. And now you're kind of just like saying, okay, if they get that buy, maybe my chance of winning goes from 5% to 10%. Like that's not enough of an edge for me where I'd rather say, no, I'm going to make this team for when the Bills don't get the buy. 
Mm -hmm. And now I'm boptopizing because now my chances of advancing are pretty high because I've got freaking Josh Allen and the Bills. Oh, and I've got some great players over here. That's what I want to go for. Because the second is if you start playing too cautious, maybe actually you've got the Bills or such. They don't make the buy in all. Um, and you needed that extra quarterback situation. Someone else didn't take that extra quarterback. And so when the times that the Bills don't get that buy, you're now fighting a major uphill battle. Because whatever player you didn't draft from the Bucks or the Seahawks that you chose to go with the QB instead, if that Super Bowl and that player hits, you're kind of blocked. Uh, so that's where, at this place, I'm still willing to take chances. Um, the other challenge, specifically with uh, the Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, is there's not really quarterbacks in the NFC side late that you love. Brock Purdy's maybe the only one. Um, but I'm going to start, you know, we're going to start seeing him move up the ranks a lot. So that's where it's like, okay, maybe I could protect myself a little, but I'm really not getting that much on the yeah. other side. Lamar is going really late. Assuming Lamar, if Lamar is healthy, that's someone that is drafted late and could give you substantial value. Yeah. And let's transition a little bit into talking more like specific hot takes here. You mentioned Lamar Baltimore to me seems like a pretty good team to to target i think they're undervalued especially given the sentiment over this losing streak that they've got going on but you're guaranteed obviously around one game for them uh where their odds make the playoffs gotta be 98 yeah 99 right now on on 538 uh it just have to run really weird for them to not make the playoffs we saw at the beginning of the season, the huge ceilings that Lamar and Andrews have. And I know there's a tendency for people to be like, well, that's that's not the case anymore, but we do want to lean into the uncertainty. We know that ceiling is there. So to me, Baltimore looks like a pretty fun team to take. And I'm assuming you agree because currently right now you have you know the majority of that team, particularly the three core players, Lamar, Andrews, and Dobbins all ranked ahead of ADP. I mean, I, I'm manually adjusting their ranks to make them even lower. Like, they all should be a lot higher when we're going purely based off math. Uh, I think Lamar, by the pure numbers of it, um, I think I was working on the ranks for getting ready to update it again. Yeah, I have Lamar as pure math-wise, basically QB3. Um and a lot of it has to do with, well, okay, maybe we're going to add a little injury risk. Maybe we do add some offense, but from a pure math base, when we're taking a look at Vegas odds, when we're taking a look at kind of the 538 projections as well as some of the other sites, like they, they still love Baltimore as a value. And uh, so I'm making sure that, Hey, when we're actually creating these ranks that they are above ADP, they are still very much values. They're telling you that, uh -huh. but obviously I don't want you drafting Lamar in the, uh, in the second round. Yep. That makes a ton of sense. Any other teams? Um, I mean, we hit on the Lions who are now up to 41%. So that's close to a coin flip. That ADP might be slow moving. The Jaguars as well was the other one that just had massive shifts in, in their odds week over week. Uh, do, you, me, do you see any other teams that are undervalued or specific players that people just seem to be overlooking because maybe they're hurt right now and they're just not on people's radar? Yeah, for me, it's the Niners and the Cowboys, because if you actually look at their paths to the Super Bowl, it's really strong. So let's start with the Niners. Uh, Niners, most likely in the first round, are going to get someone like the Giants um, at home. Niners have looked really good. They win that. They most likely then go to the two seed, which is then playing at Minnesota, which, again, very winnable based off what we've seen. They would be favorites in that game. Now you've got San Francisco in the conference championship, most likely going against Philadelphia, which obviously isn't going to be easy, or who knows, maybe Philly gets upset. Uh, but like there in that situation, we're getting some very strong games against, you know, a home game for that first one playing at Minnesota in the dome against the high powered offense. Like those are two very high scoring games where San Francisco should be favorites. Uh, that's why I love them. Dallas is the second one. Dallas has pretty much locked themselves into the five seed. And that's pretty much locked themselves into a game against whoever's going to win the NFC South, most likely the Bucs. So Dallas, we know that they're playing in the first round. Going against Tampa, um, I think – so one of the things that I was looking at earlier today – or yesterday um, was defensive line rankings. San Francisco is second. Dallas is first. We saw what that defensive line did to the Tampa two weeks ago, and I have a feeling that exact same thing would happen to – 
Um, yeah, if you take a look there from the line rankings, that's what I was looking at. Uh, we saw what San Francisco was able to do to that offensive line that's just so hurt by Tampa that I think Dallas would have their way as well. So Dallas goes into Tampa, wins that. Then Dallas, one of two things happens. Either they go to Philly if both San Francisco or Min- and Minnesota win, or if someone does pull off the upset of Minnesota, which would not be the most shocking either, they then go to San Francisco. And that's still a Brock Purdy San Francisco. And I could see Dallas then having the opportunity to uh, you know pull, pull off another W there. So for someone who's going to have an away game, knowing it's against the Bucs, um, that's another team that like, you know, Vegas likes, looks really good from metrics and everything, despite their past two kind of ugly games. Maybe that's going to suppress the value a little. Um, but uh, those are the two teams that I'm really, I'm really strong for. Yeah. And Minnesota 11 and three with a, a plus two point differential, which seems impossible uh, as they just had the, the greatest comeback in NFL history against the Colts team, uh, nipped them by three points in overtime. So they're a weak team. Have you noticed with Minnesota, are people drafting them as a like a week two seed or are they drafting them as a pretty, pretty normal two seed? Um, well, I mean, I think it's because look at who their studs are. Justin Jefferson is still being drafted. Um, let me see if I have ADP right now. Justin Jefferson is still being drafted seven earlier in the season. Earlier in the, like in the playoffs, he was kind of looking at like five to six. So not much change there. Dalvin has dropped a bit, and I think that was mainly because two weeks, like the last two weeks, Dalvin really did not produce at all. This week he did, so my guess is he's going to move up a little. But you can see, for the most part, we're still kind of ahead of them because the numbers are implying that, hey, they're going to be a 2C that's going to play the first round, that's going to have at least um, two home games. Those are great on high-powered offenses. So like the numbers like Vikings more than the public, which is why our ranks kind of are better than the ADP. Um but you're getting I, I the get right, it. like again, the best players too. Like if the Vikings hit, like Dalvin and Jefferson are scoring a bunch of points. Um, it's it's pretty clear cut that your odds of advancing are really good if the Vikings hit. There's some teams you could draft and they could win. You might not advance because you don't have the you know just the right mix of players. Yeah, and, and one thing that I touch on the article, I think it was the very last paragraph of the article, um, but it says, "Hey, think multiple picks ahead." Study the ADP and actually build out what you think kind of a trajectory to a draft is. And when we talked about the Vikings, I uh, Jefferson seven, Dalvin Cook, I think was like 1916 or something. That means you can grab probably an NFC, I mean an AFC guy, either Stefan Diggs or Travis Kelsey, or maybe Josh Allen, Patrick Holmes in the first, Jefferson in the second, have another choice of something in the third, and Dalvin in the fourth. This is setting up for a nice kind of structure where you're getting one of the best teams in the AFC and now a Minnesota stack. And so as you do more drafts, as you study the ADP, that's where you should start kind of getting a feel for, huh, I like these ones together. It works from a getting the studs and stuff. And uh, what works now is not going to probably work in a week or two. So that's why it's important to really be drafting throughout the entire time because those teams that I was getting early on with Eagles and Chargers and Ravens, you probably can't get those anymore because now we know that the Chargers are in the playoffs and are looking really good. Yeah. And conversely, a team like the Dolphins that has been falling, I wonder if we see the ADP drop enough where they become pretty interesting. Another team where uh, just off feel, I think they have still pretty legitimate upside as a team to be able to go far. But again, and if you hit on them, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell, Tua is going to hit in a pretty big way. And um, it is fun making bets on teams that are guaranteed to play the wild card round because it makes the construction a little bit easier if you're making, you know, if that team goes to the Super Bowl, you've also got a good chance of advancing out of the first round there. I know in regular best ball, we think a lot about drafting unique players, you know, guys who don't get drafted a lot. Does that come into play here at all? Or are you just more worried about unique combinations of teams? I think it actually comes into play here more than regular best ball because with regular best ball, yes. I mean, there's two things to drafting unique players. There's the, let me draft the unique player. That's actually going to break out and be a stud. Obviously that's very valuable, but then we talk about it as maybe you can draft that unique player that in week 17 has the spike week or such. The challenge is in regular best ball, that spike week is still competing against the entire, everyone else playing in week 17. So even going four for 80 with a touchdown isn't 
amazing compared to you're competing against all the other studs. Think of the Super Bowl now. Super Bowl is now two teams. If you get someone who goes four for 80, even one for 60 in a touchdown, that's huge and necessary. And if you're the only one that has that in that final week, that's amazing leverage. And so that's why I think it's most important in this. If you know what two stacks you're going to go with and you feel confident in like your players, maybe you're looking at, okay, um, Bills, um, Dawson Knox isn't being drafted that much. I think like um, what I use, I think bank, let's go to Bengals. Yeah, I was surprised McKenzie was drafted as frequently as he is. I was going to use him as an example. Yeah, but he's, the he's best teams, people are just trying to get all the pieces. But for those second and third ones, it's not yeah. nearly as much. Hayden Hurst hasn't been healthy, but like, could you very much see Hayden Hurst getting one of the only three touchdowns in the Super Bowl or something? Sure. It's not hard for a player just to catch a touchdown. And then, I mean, you think of showdown slates, you get a touchdown. All you got to do now is be one of the top four kind of uh, uh, positional players. Yep. That makes a ton of sense. All right. This was great, Justin. Anything else before we hop off? No, this is um, always enjoy doing these. Um, I'll be doing some more kind of throughout the holidays, getting some, um, doing some live drafts and such. I think the one takeaway that I've had this year that I think other people, um, from what I've learned, is the hardest construction and the most uncomfortable is going to be drafting a one seed. So right now it's the Eagles. Soon we'll know more about the Bills and and, and Chiefs and stuff. Drafting that and then drafting a structured, well structured team to support that because last year. Mm-hmm. We didn't have a one seed make the playoffs. I mean, make the Super Bowl. Um, and so it was just a whole bunch of like, ah, the Rams, the Bengals, I can take them all. I blah, blah, blah. Like it, it works out well. I think most likely that we're going to have a one seed in the Super Bowl this year. Eagles just look heads over shoulders above the rest of the NFC. And then Bengals are, you know, the AFC is really strong. Um, but like, yeah, Bills, Chiefs could make it. And in those scenarios, if you can get a team that can advance in that one out of six in the first round and then keep going, I think that's going to be a highly valued, high levered team in the Super Bowl just because it's so hard to do in this structure. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how that shakes out. Justin, thank you so much for joining me. Again, everybody check out Underdog Fantasy. Get in some of these playoff best ball drafts. Use promo code ETR over there. And if you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to us. If you're listening to iTunes, uh, do the same. Leave us a review. It helps a lot to continue doing Establish the Edge for free. Appreciate it, everyone. Best of luck in the playoffs.